So in our final section, we move into tissue growth, development, repair, and death. Tissue growth is increasing the number of cells or the existing cells are going to grow larger. Hyperplasia is tissue growth through cell multiplication. And hypertrophy is the enlargement of pre-existing cells. So muscle cells grow in size through exercise. This is hypertrophy. We won't see muscle cells really ever grow through the process of hyperplasia. Body fat is the same consideration. We never really gain more body fat cells. Now, of course, there are exceptions to this never. We just fill up the body fat cells that we have. Now, in an extreme situation, they can be stimulated to divide. That, that's not normal. Neoplasia is the development of a tumor or neoplasm. They can be either benign or malignant. They're composed of abnormal and non-functional tissue. Tissues can actually change types. The process of differentiation is where we take unspecialized tissue, say of an embryo, and it becomes specialized as the embryo matures. For example, mesenchyme that's derived from mesoderm will become muscle. Metaplasia is where we change from one type of mature tissue to another type of mature tissue. For example, the vagina is composed of simple cuboidal tissue before puberty. And after puberty, it changes into stratified squamous epithelium. Usually in the bronchi, we have pseudostratified columnar epithelium. However, in smokers, it converts to stratified squamous epithelium, which, as you can see, probably has an influence on gas exchange. Stem cells are undifferentiated cells that are not yet performing any specialized function. They have a potential to differentiate into one or more types of different mature functional cells. For example, in our bone marrow, we have pluripotent stem cells that will become our various types of blood cells. The developmental plasticity of a cell refers to the variety of different mature cell types which a particular stem cell can give rise to. There are multiple different types of stem cells for us to understand. There are totipotent, which means they have the potential to develop into any type of fully differentiated human cell. These are the source cells of the very, very early embryo. Totipotent stem cells are the ones that have so much of the controversy going on at the moment. Pluripotent stem cells can develop into any type of tissue in the embryo. These are the cells of the inner cell mass of the developing embryo. Adult stem cells are undifferentiated cells in tissues of adults. They can either be multipotent, like the bone marrow cells that I referred to, or they can be unipotent, which they're most limited in their plasticity. For example, in the skin, these unipotent stem cells could only become epidermal cells. Okay, so take a moment here Close your books, close your notes, and see if you can differentiate the different types of stem cells. From the two types of embryonic stem cells, what's the difference between totipotent and pluripotent? And then in adult stem cells, multipotent and unipotent. Now let's move on and look at some tissue repair. Tissue repair involves regeneration or replacement of dead or damaged cells by same type of cells as before. This restores normal function and it's involved in things like skin injuries and liver regeneration. Fibrosis is the replacement of damaged cells with scar tissue. So it doesn't restore the normal function. It just holds the organ together. Severe cuts and burns healing of muscle injuries, and scarring of the lungs and tuberculosis will involve fibrosis. Let's look at wound healing. In wound healing, we're going to see that the severed blood vessels bleed into the cut. The mast cells and damaged cells are going to release histamine. This is going to dilate the blood vessels and increase blood flow to the area, which makes the capillaries more permeable. The blood plasma is going to seep into the wound. As it does that, it's going to carry antibodies as well as clotting proteins and blood cells in order to protect the wound. 
Shortly, a blood clot is going to form in the tissue. This loosely knits the edges of the cut together and inhibits the spread of pathogens from the injury site into healthy tissue. The scab forms, and that's going to temporarily seal the wound and block it from infection. The macrophages that you see in here in purple are then going to start going around and cleaning up. Macrophages are the cleanup cells. They'll digest old tissue and debris. In about three to four days, we'll see that new capillaries sprout from nearby vessels and grow into the wound. You can see here in the lower layer. The deeper portions are going to become infiltrated by these capillaries, as well as fibroblasts. They'll transform it into soft mass or granulation tissue. The macrophages, the cleanup guys, are going to begin to remove the blood clot. The fibroblasts are going to deposit new collagen and begin to fill in the space. This process can last up to two weeks. Now we move into a stage where we see epithelial regeneration. The surface epithelial cells around the wound are going to multiply and migrate into the wound area beneath the scab. The connective tissue is going to undergo fibrosis beneath that. Now, scar tissue may or may not show through the epithelium, depending on the depth and width of the cut. Then we'll see remodeling or maturation begin. This is several weeks after the injury, and it could last up to two years as the site of the injury becomes less and less apparent. Tissue shrinkage and death, atrophy, is shrinkage of tissue through a loss in cell size or number. Our muscles will atrophy as we don't use them. Senile atrophy is what happens through normal aging, and disuse atrophy comes from lack of use. Astronauts will experience disuse atrophy because there's a lack of gravity in the environment that they spend time in space. Necrosis is premature pathological death of a tissue due to trauma or toxins or infections. Like many spider bites will cause necrosis of tissue. It's a blackening even. Infarction is sudden death of a tissue where blood supply is cut off, like myocardial infarction or heart attack. Gangrene is where we'll see tissue necrosis due to insufficient blood supply. And dissipitous ulcers, those are necrosis like a bed sore or pressure sore. It reduces blood flow to an area. It's a form of dry gangrene. There's also gas gangrene, which results from anaerobic bacterial infections. Apoptosis is programmed cell death, so cells are dying at the appropriate time. They've been pre-programmed to die at that time. Apoptosis is the normal death of cells that have completed their function and best serve the body by dying and getting out of the way. So this would be a great place to pause a moment, close your notes, and see what you can sum up about wound healing. Refer to the figures in your book. See if you can fill in the stages. And then take a look at tissue shrinkage and death. Summarize the different ways that tissue can either shrink or die. And then we'll move on to tissue engineering. Tissue engineering is the artificial production of tissues and organs in the lab for implantation into the human body. We create a framework of collagen or biodegradable polyester fibers, and we seed them with human cells. They grow in a bioreactor, for example, inside a mouse, which supplies them with the nutrients and oxygen for the growing tissue. This technology is amazing for the creation of such things as skin grafts. These are already available biotissues. The research is in progress to create heart valves, coronary arteries, bone, liver, and tendons from this methodology. Now, as you know, there's a strong stem cell controversy. Stem cells can be used for possible treatment of diseases that's caused by loss of functional cell types. And we can use embryonic stem cells to accomplish this. For example, spinal cord injuries and cardiac muscle cells. And a big one of interest to me is we can 
create insulin secreting cells and implant them into the pancreas of type 1 diabetics so that their own body can once again regulate their blood sugars. The possibilities with stem cells are endless. Medicine these days is really moving away from treating the symptoms with drugs to actually treating the root of the problem by using stem cell technologies. This would be a great topic if someone wanted to take it on for their end of semester presentation. Things like skin and bone marrow stem cells have been used in therapy for years. Now, our government currently doesn't permit us to use any newly generated stem cell lines under federal funding. That means everything has to be privately funded. However, when you look around the rest of the world, most places are allowed to do this sort of stem cell research. So what do you think is happening to much of our revenues from medicines? Adult stem cells have very limited developmental potential. They're difficult to harvest in culture, but that's all we can really use right now until we clear up the issues with the use of embryonic stem cells. One of the things that I find most interesting here is some of the people that are most against the use of embryonic stem cells are people that are using in vitro fertilization technologies. And they're quite willing to throw away their embryos that are not implanted. However, not willing to use the stem cells from those embryos to solve disease, even in their own family. Another great topic for your end of semester presentation. So that concludes our chapter on histology. Have fun doing your project. And we'll see you soon for the integumentary system.